Hi, Hardball listeners. It's Chris. You may have heard me mention on the show that I host an original podcast called So You Want to Be President. Across six episodes, I talk to campaign veterans about six timeless themes that separate winners from losers. We thought we would share a preview of each of the six episodes with you. You can stay right here and listen to a preview of the fourth episode, Play from the Back. To hear the full episode and get the entire series, search for So You Want to Be President wherever you're listening right now, and subscribe. Let me say that while the evening is young and we don't know yet what the final tally will be, I think we know enough to say with some certainty that New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. Bill Clinton hadn't won anything when he gave that speech in New Hampshire during the 1992 race. It's why that moment is what we're talking about for lesson four in this podcast. So you want to be president, know how to play from the back, know how to translate a loss into a win. Susan Del Percio and Beth Fui join me this week. Susan's a Republican strategist who worked for both New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. She's now a political analyst for NBC News. Beth Fui is the senior editor of politics at NBC News. Now, I had a slight cold when the three of us sat down to talk. It reminds me of what Ronald Reagan once said. I did turn 75 today. But remember, that's only 24 Celsius. By the way, it's been in the 20s this week in New Hampshire. All right, let's set this up. When Bill Clinton ran for president in 1992, he was governor for many years of Arkansas. I got into politics to change people's lives for the better. And for 11 years, that's what I've worked to do for better jobs and better education, for health care, to solve social problems, to bring people together. That's what we need to do in America today. Put our own house in order, restore the middle class, reduce poverty, organize this country to compete and win again. I've got a fine national economic strategy, but in the end, a plan is still a piece of paper. To change lives, you need vision and leadership and action. That's the work of my life, and that's why I'm running for president. How did he stack up in the beginning of that race as he went into it, Beth, against... uh well, people like Bob Carey of Nebraska, uh, Paul Sangas of Massachusetts, Tom Harkin of Iowa, and of course, Jerry Brown was making another comeback. Right. So we were coming out of the Gulf War, that first Gulf War that President George H.W. Bush managed flawlessly. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. He had stratospheric popularity ratings. I think at one point he hit almost 90 percent popularity across the general public. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. A lot of Democrats just looked at that and said there is no way that uh, President Bush is is vulnerable this time. So a lot of Democrats sort of took a pass on this race, most notably Mario Cuomo, then the governor of New York, who had uh, looked like he was getting in and then at the very last minute pulled back and decided not to. So enter Bill Clinton. This is the story of a young man born in a small town called Hope, Hope, Arkansas. The son of a widow. Who he at that point was this sort of up and coming, uh, hot shot young governor of Arkansas. He had been selected to keynote the 1988 Democratic Convention in Atlanta. You might ask, if you're looking at this on television, what has this got to do with me? If I've got a job or my business is in good shape or my kids in college, why should I worry? I'll tell you why. Because the children that are in trouble tonight are the workers of tomorrow. And if they can't do the jobs of tomorrow, we're all going to suffer and America will not be able to 
fulfill its dream and its destiny. People recognized his talent. They recognized his intelligence. They recognized his his gift of of speaking uh, very beautifully. He was running against uh, a bunch of characters who weren't necessarily the A list of Democrats at that point. Uh, Tom Harkin, very revered senator uh, from Iowa, but also very very liberal at a time when uh, Democrats were trying to tack to the center. In grade school, Sister Rose Angela taught me, you can't be all things to all people. Well, these other candidates say they're for the middle class, yet they all want more tax breaks for the wealthy and the big corporations. Well, they can't have it both ways. Jerry Brown, former governor of California, the one the political establishment fears most. Jerry Brown had run a couple of other times for governor in 1976 and 1980 had been a fairly successful governor of California, but he was still kind of uh, tagged as Governor Moonbeam. Um, and then Paul Songus, who was a uh, was uh, coming off a cancer diagnosis. He was a thoughtful, smart, intelligent lawmaker, but was kind of a Debbie Downer. He talked all the time about debt and deficits and not a lot of magic, not a lot of poetry. Paul Songus, he'll take charge from the start. Paid for by the Songus Committee. So that's kind of the the field that Bill Clinton was walking into. Susan, it was a race that began with people thinking, they, as Beth said, you couldn't beat George Herbert Walker Bush. He was the war hero. That's right. And when in January of 1992, he was at 46%, which was almost a 40% drop from where he was that August as in 1991, where candidates were starting to make that decision. I think that the Democrats underestimated just how weak Bush was at that moment in time because they kept thinking about his popularity in the summer, even into the fall. But then the economy started to turn. And there were two other people who were kind of nipping at his heels. Hi, I'm Pat Buchanan. Together we can change the course of America. You had Pat Buchanan, and then you also had Ross Perot. If we were just playing a picnic... Instead of trying to plan a future for our children, chicken and potato chips might be exactly what we need. He was coming in third party. He didn't formally announce until two days after New Hampshire, the New Hampshire primary, but he was out there talking a lot. He had done a lot of uh, radio and CNN, and he was there talking. So, But they didn't think it was that serious at the time. Well, I want to tell you, that I'm a fighter for people. Let's talk about Tom Harkin. Uh, here he is. Uh, he was the senator from Iowa. He's a, a liberal, I think, by most most standards. Sometimes I use strong language. Sometimes you got to use strong language to get it through their thick skulls. What's going on in this country? Uh, very big on labor. Uh, I would say an unashamed liberal all the way, a progressive, as we say today. Let's listen to him now uh, before the Iowa caucuses. If you want to move this country forward with big changes, I need your help and your support. You here in Iowa with these caucuses, as I said, can fire that first shot. (laughs) Fire it loud and clear and send a message to the rest of the country that we've had enough of Bush. We're proud to be Democrats. And it's those traditional values and new ideas, traditional values and new solutions that we bring to the American people that will defeat George Bush and win the White House for so did he win the Iowa caucus? He ended up getting, I just checked, 76 and a half percent in the Iowa caucuses. Did he do it because of geography? Oh, he was absolutely the hometown favorite. He was favorite son. All the Democrats decided not to play in Iowa, so he had the field to himself. He also had a large um, war chest going into this as a senator. So if you remember nothing else of what I told you today and this evening, remember one thing. I can whip. George Herbert Hoover Bush. Hey, I was out there, uh, Beth, I was out there the night of the caucuses. The only other person in the political world out there was uh, Jules Whitcover, one of the great boys in the bus. Sure. And nobody else was covering it because the home state guy, the favorite son, was supposed to win it. Yeah, and and that actually was a great blessing for these other Democrats in the field because, uh, as you guys know, the Iowa caucuses are so labor-intensive. They're so money-intensive. It's so hard to play in Iowa to win. And if you have an excuse not to, if you can say, well, 
that guy's the hometown favorite. He's the favorite son. I'm not even going to bother. And then shift your resources over to New Hampshire and to those later states. It's it's a huge advantage for other Democrats not have to having to compete there. Well, since we're studying Bill Clinton, uh, who is a political genius in many ways, uh, still is, I think. How did he know that he could skip Iowa? Well, he knew because Harkin was going to win it, uh, and he knew that the action was going to be in New Hampshire, that that was where he had the chance to prove his case, to make the case that he could be electable across a broad spectrum of voters. We forget now because we think of New Hampshire as being kind of a blue or a purplish blue state. At the time, New Hampshire was was fairly conservative uh, because in New Hampshire, uh, independents can vote in either primary. And there's so many, uh, such a large percentage of New, of New Hampshire voters are independents. It could potentially attract sort of these moderate uh, middle of the road folks who lived in Iowa but could respond to Bill, Bill Clinton's message. So that's why he thought that was fruitful ground for him. And here is uh, here is Tom Arkin, the winner in Iowa, Iowa caucuses in 1992 on C-SPAN. After his win in Iowa, he he was asked at that point about his plans as the campaign moved to New Hampshire the following week. Well, I'll be in New Hampshire all week, uh, my wife and I campaigning, uh, getting my message through to the people up there. And I think that message has been a little, oh, muted, perhaps uh, distorted because of all the static that's been in the air because of, well, some of these other things that have been happening in the campaign, if you know what I mean. Well, what was the static he was talking about, Susan? <laughs> I think we all know now. Yeah, it was Jennifer Flowers. I will start by explaining why I came forward to tell my story about my affair with Governor Bill Clinton. There was rumors at the time that he was having an affair. Yes, I was Bill Clinton's lover for 12 years. And for the past two years, I have lied to the press about our relationship to protect him. The truth is, I loved him. Now he tells me to deny it. Well, I'm sick of all of the deceit, and I'm sick of all of the lies. Well, that was dramatic. I'm not sure he got a big press pickup in like the New York Times, but I'm sure it was around in the tabs. But uh, getting the jump on that press conference the very night before on 60 Minutes, I think one of the top, if not the top rated television show there was and is, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton showed up together in a united front. And here they are. Who is Jennifer Flowers? You know her. Oh, yeah. How do you know? How would you describe your relationship? A very limited, uh, but until this, you know, friendly, but limited. I had I met her uh, in the late seventies when I was attorney general, uh, and she was one of a number of young people who were working for the television stations around Little Rock. And, uh, the people in politics and the people in the media knew each other then, just as they do now. Uh, she left our state, uh, and for years I didn't really hear from her, know what she was doing. Uh, and then she came back, uh, I don't know, sometime a few years ago, and uh, went to work again in the state. Uh, so that's how, that's who she is. Was she a friend, an acquaintance? Does your wife know her? Oh, oh yes. Oh, sure. She was an acquaintance, I would say, a friendly acquaintance. She's a legend and is described in some detail in a supermarket tabloid, which she calls a 12-year affair with you. It, that allegation is false. This caused a concussion in Bill Clinton's campaign. It wasn't long before a second scandal broke. We'll see how it set the stage for the emergence of the comeback kid in a moment. Stick around. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this preview, search for So You Want to Be President wherever you're listening right now to hear the full episode and subscribe to the entire series.